Hello and welcome to our program, In the Know, Key Abstracts from the American Society of Hematology 2021 Annual Meeting in Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia. This program is supported by an independent medical education grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Before we start, please take a moment to let us know who you are and answer the pre-polls in the tweets below. Tweets also include details regarding how to obtain your free CME credit. Be sure to watch our handles for additional ALL CME programming as this program is a six part series and follow at Bonham CE for more CME certified programs on Twitter. I'm Dr. Luke Mays, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Utah School of Medicine, Huntsman Cancer Institute and Primary Children's Hospital. I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleague, Dr. Ryan Cassidy. Thanks, Luke. Uh, I'm Dr. Ryan Cassidy. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine and Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. You can see our disclosures on the screen. Today we'll be discussing blinitumumab, which is a bispecific CD19-directed CD3 T-cell engager indicated for the treatment of adults and children with CD19-positive B-cell precursor acute lymphoblastic leukemia and first or second complete remission with minimal residual disease, also known as MRD, greater than or equal to 0.1%, as well as in relapsed or refractory CD19-positive B-cell precursor acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Both of these studies assessed the value of blinitumumab based on risk, which included MRD status as part of risk classification, but was not based on MRD status alone. So this educational activity will allow for review of recently presented clinical trial data in low risk first relapse of B-cell ALL in children, adolescents, and young adults, along with reviewing a recently presented clinical trial in high risk Philadelphia negative acute lymphoblastic leukemia adult patients. We'll be discussing the randomized phase three trial of blinitumumab versus chemotherapy as post-reinduction therapy and low risk first relapse of B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children, adolescents, and young adults, which was a report from the Children's Oncology Group Study, AALL 1331. This study was led by Dr. Pat Brown uh, and was a seminal report within pediatric relapse disease. So here we will first review the objectives, inclusion criteria, and the endpoints of the study. The objective was to determine if substituting blinitumumab for intensive chemotherapy and consolidation would improve survival and first relapse of childhood in AYA acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The study included children, adolescents, and AYAs aged 1 to 30 years in first relapse of their B-cell ALL. This report is only focused on the low-risk population, and this was defined as post-block 1 of chemotherapy, which included patients who had late marrow relapse within the COG. This is classified as greater than or equal to 36 months, and an end of block 1 minimal residual disease less than 0.1%. Additionally, the population also included late isolated extramedullary relapse patients. This definition is greater than or equal to 18 months. And they also needed an end of block one MRD less than 0.1%, or they could have an indeterminate MRD based on central analysis. Patients were excluded if they had Down syndrome, pH positive disease, a prior transplant or prior exposure to blinitumumab itself. The endpoints revolved around disease-free survival and overall survival. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to a control chemotherapy arm, arm C, versus an experimental arm containing blinitumumab, arm D. After block one randomization, all patients received the second block of arm C, proceeding to block three, based on the UK ALLL R3 chemotherapy backbone, followed by two continuation blocks in maintenance to complete two years of therapy. The experimental arm D proceeded with a 20-day continuous blinitumumab infusion at a dose of 15 micrograms per meter squared per day followed by continuation one and two in maintenance with two additional cycles of blinitumumab intermixed. So looking at the outcomes of this population of patients, 250 patients were randomized on the study. After a median follow-up of 2.9 years, the four-year disease-free survival was 61% in ARMD compared with 48% in ARMC, which was not statistically different in the Kaplan-Meier curve on the left. Similarly, no difference was observed in overall survival between the two arms. And this was true, importantly, when considering all low-risk relapse patients, regardless of site, uh, marrow, or extramedullary disease. But importantly, as we mentioned, this population was uh, divided out further. And 
looking here, we see this data according to site of relapse. So patients with marrow plus or minus extramedullary disease on the left versus patients with isolated relapse of their extramedullary disease on the right. And first you can see in the relapse row that the percentage of patients with second relapse is higher in patients with isolated extramedullary disease. And for bone marrow relapses, there was a significant difference between the two arms in both four-year disease-free survival and overall survival as highlighted in the red box at 84% in arm C versus a superior overall survival in arm D at 96.6%. However, no difference was observed in disease-free survival or overall survival for patients with isolated extramedullary disease. Looking at the tolerability uh, and comparing the, the toxicity of these two arms, lanitumumab was less toxic relative to block three chemotherapy, a higher rate of grade three for febrile neutropenia, infection, anemia, and mucositis was observed with chemotherapy in block three when compared with the first cycle of blinitumab. And with blinitumab, we know there are toxicities of special interest, which are included in the table on the right. Cytokine release syndrome, seizures, and neurotoxicity were generally low in grade and reversible when they did occur. There were higher rates of blinitumab-related adverse events in cycle one, and lower uh, rates in subsequent cycles, which has been reported in other investigations of this medication. So in summary, blinitumab was well tolerated relative to block three chemotherapy. Blinitumab inclusion in the treatment schema of low risk B-cell ALL patients with bone marrow plus or minus extramedullary first relapse was associated with superior disease-free survival and overall survival relative to standard chemotherapy. And with this report, this does represent a new standard of therapy for this particular subgroup of patients. Thanks, Luke, for that summary. Um, I was hoping I could ask a couple of questions and make a couple of comments. So, you know, the first thing that, that strikes me about these data, uh, the control arm, so the, the, the arm that got standard chemotherapy, considering that these were all uh, considered to be low risk patients in first relapse, it didn't appear to perform quite as well as historically one would expect. Um, you know, there's some possible explanations for that later administration of cranial radiation, or possibly because we've gotten better at managing frontline uh, ALL, uh, so the people who relapse are going to have, uh, you know, sort of worse disease, so to speak. Um, so, you know, based on the, those sort of, you know, hypotheses or findings, I'm curious, how does that impact how you interpret the results of the, the, the experimental arm, the blinitumumab arm? These are great points, and I think there's so much to be gleaned from this study, right? I think you made a, a key point there in the middle uh, regarding the changing, uh, the changing environment of our relapsed patients. This is both in, in all, you know, pediatric AYA adult patients, right? We're, our upfront protocols uh, are different than they were 20 years ago. And so, you know, the, the relapsed, um, the relapsed patients are going to be different as well. And, and, and Dr. Brown, who, who uh, led the relapsed kind of uh, uh, efforts within COG, consistently goes back to that. And I think that's important when we're thinking about these patients and, and you made a good point. I do also agree um, about the radiation. I think um, the radiation uh, was administered, you know, a little bit differently uh, on this trial. Uh, and, you know, we, we know that, 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 that this can, can uh, have effects on, on outcomes in, in this group of patients. I would also add which we didn't really talk about in this review, but the, the abstract does. And so I encourage um, everyone to go back and look at it. And there will be a manuscript that comes out uh, as well. Uh, but uh, when you look at, at patients by age, right, we know that, that older patients um, often have more difficulties, certainly in the pediatric AYA range, um, you know, greater than 18 uh, years of age um, in, in this subgroup of patients did fare worse. And, and, and and those patients are actually going to be separated out in, in, in um, future studies and in our future current study that's going on, this group of patients is, you know, is, is being separated out. Uh, so, so another kind of thing to think about as well. Yeah, for sure, thanks. Um, and then lastly, the, as, you, as you concluded uh, with your summary that you know, the author's conclusion from this study was that the, they indicate that blinitumumab based regimen like this is now the new standard of care for low risk patients with ALL uh, in first relapse, either with 
bone with bone marrow and or extramedullary disease. So sort of this represents a new standard for these lower risk patients. Would you agree with that conclusion? I would to a certain extent. I do think that, um, you know, using blinitumab is, is, an, is a new standard for these patients. Uh, one caveat to this too, though, would be, you know, the, the, the chemotherapy backbone. I think that there is some more nuances to the data, which shows that maybe some of these patients do have a little bit higher risk of an extramedullary disease relapse um, after getting this, this base regimen. And, you know, this is likely right due to the fact that blinitumab does not penetrate the CNS, right? And, and we know that that's a fact. And so we need to optimize our chemotherapy uh, for uh, that protection for these patients as well. And, and we're doing that in our new study and, and, and uh, we, will, we will see kind of the results of that. Great, thanks a lot for, for that discussion. Uh, so I'm gonna take the reins now and move on to a second study that was presented at last year's ASH meeting. This now gonna be uh, in adults uh, with B-cell ALL and, and distinctly, while this is also a study of blinitumumab, this is frontline treatment. So this is frontline consolidation with blinitumumab for high risk Philadelphia chromosome negative acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients, uh, early results from the GRAL 2014 QUEST phase two study. The objective of this study was to assess the benefit of blinitumumab as part of consolidation and maintenance therapy in adult patients with high risk pH negative B precursor ALL. Key inclusion criteria as stated here, these were all high risk adults between the ages of 18 and 59. They defined high risk based on the presence of any of those three factors listed on the screen. The presence of a KMT2A rearrangement, uh, formerly known as MLL rearrangement, the presence of an IKZF1 deletion, or relatively high level of measurable residual disease greater than 0.01% at the first time point of assessment. Additionally, patients had to be in complete remission prior to starting consolidation block two, and they had to have a relatively low level of CNS involvement, no significant CNS involvement at diagnosis. Key exclusion criteria, again, this was a study of pH negative disease, so they could not have the Philadelphia chromosome, and they could not have a poor performance status. The primary endpoint for the study is disease-free survival at three years, with secondary endpoints including tolerance, overall survival, cumulative incidence of relapse, non-relapse mortality, and then looking at minimal residual disease responses. So the QUEST substudy treatment uh, schema is depicted here. So uh, as is fairly typical for ALL regimens, it's a bit complicated, so a bit hard to, to summarize on a single slide. But you can see on the left, the different components. There's a prednisone prephase followed by a five-drug induction, which includes cyclophosphamide, prednisone, vincristine, donorubicin, and asparaginase. And then there are these consolidation blocks of therapy with blinitumumab coming in during the second consolidation course. And then there's a delayed intensification for those that do not go on to allogeneic stem cell transplantation with additional cycles of blinitumumab thereafter, including, importantly, on the far right, the patients that don't go to stem cell transplant and first remission uh, the blinitumumab was continued intermittently during their two years of maintenance therapy. So it's a relatively uh, prolonged course of treatment with uh, continued exposure to blinitumumab really throughout the first, you know, almost year of their treatment. So here are the preliminary results that were reported at the meeting, disease-free survival on the left and overall survival on the right. 94 patients were included here, and you can see the 18-month disease-free survival of nearly 80% and the 18 month overall survival of a little over 90%. The median follow-up at this point was uh, 20 months. Um, <clears throat> so still relatively short, uh, but starting to see uh, some longer term follow-up uh, with some patients uh, now out past uh, two years when this uh, uh, report was, uh, was uh, presented. Now, if we look at the MRD status over time and how blinitumumab affected that, the color-coded bar graph on the left, capturing MRD status at different time points during their course of treatment. TP1 is time point one. Then there's the assessment that occurs pre-blinitumumab, so basically pre-consolidation two, and then post-blinitumumab after their first exposure. The different colors represent depth of MRD detection with the light gray bar at the bottom representing no detectable disease with the subsequent colors going to the top showing increasing levels of disease with, for example, the blue line is one to 10% and the green is greater than 
And essentially what you can see is the deeper you get into treatment uh, with the uh, chemotherapy-based approaches, which is the TPI column and the pre-BLIN column, you can see you know, increasing numbers of patients achieving deeper levels of response, but still a fair number of patients that have persistent disease, but a fairly significant increase in the number of patients that achieve MRD negativity following that exposure to blinitumumab, with 89% of the patients on the study either being undetectable or sort of an intermediate level of detection of less than 0.01%. Importantly, though, if we look at the figure on the right, this is now looking at disease-free survival based on MRD status after blinitumumab. And you can see excellent disease-free survival in the blue line, which are the patients that were MRD negative after blinitumumab. The gray line, however, here are the patients that still had detectable disease after blinitumumab. And you can see that a significant proportion of those patients ultimately had a relapse or death in this case. So a pretty significant difference there with a hazard ratio of four and a half and a p-value of 0.01. Importantly, the addition of blinitumumab to frontline consolidation therapy was safe, uh, which is you know, largely re, uh, recapitulating what's been described in other uh, studies, including the one that, uh, that Luke presented earlier. The rates of CRS were very low. Neurotoxicity was relatively uncommon with a number of these events actually happening fairly late after exposure, after a stem cell transplant. Infections were also seen, not terribly surprisingly, uh, which included things like central venous catheter infections, febrile neutropenia. Uh, in the era of COVID-19, there were some cases of that as well. Uh, other fairly uh, germane uh, infections, nothing particularly uh, striking or noteworthy. Importantly, while this is a preliminary report, more data are needed to determine the value of blinitumumab by risk rather than MRD. So frontline consolidation with blinitumumab combined with chemotherapy is safe based on the experience so far in this study. With limited follow-up, the outcome of adult patients receiving blinitumumab as part of consolidation for first-line treatment for B-cell ALL is favorable. The absence of MRD negativity after blinitumumab is associated with a shorter disease-free survival. In a comparison of this subgroup with high-risk patients treated on the same GRAL 2014 study before the onset of the QUEST substudy is planned after longer follow-up has occurred. So we'll be able to see, not in a randomized head-to-head -head comparison, uh, but a bit how those patients fared uh, historically before uh, the inclusion of blinitumumab. Thanks for that, Ryan. That's a super interesting report and um, lots of stuff to, to think about with this. And, and I agree yet. Uh, with the conclusion, we need to see kind of how this pans out, you know, with the, in, in terms of a longer follow-up, but what do you think, what do you think, you, you, you kind of mentioned this at the head, head of the conclusion, what should we take home uh, from, from these studies with respect to using binotumab based on risk rather than based on just MRD status? Do you think that that is something that, that is useful, you know, potentially uh, more people are going to be doing going forward? Or how do you see this this working out? Yeah, so I think this represents a a more nuanced uh, view of ALL. Uh, while MRD is is clearly really important, um, you know, in my view, um, patients that are at really high risk of relapse, even if they are MRD negative by the assays that we have, the presumption is that their disease is still there. We just can't detect it. Right. So if we can if we can improve or optimize the treatments, even for those patients that we know are at high risk of relapse, uh, even though we can't necessarily detect it with the assays available, that, you know, making incremental improvements like incorporating blinitumumab, um, like, you know, as this study uh, uh, attempted to do, uh, I think are going to be really important and could potentially help improve uh, the outcomes for more patients as opposed to relying on MRD status alone. My, my personal opinion is I think largely a lot of these risk factors like KMT2A rearrangements, IKZF1 deletions, and others, my view is that those largely predict who will achieve good uh, response to treatment, which we assess by MRD status, and MRD ends up being a more uh, useful predictor of outcome but I don't think it's quite that simple. I think those risk factors do still play a role. So incorporating them in how we stratify these patients, I think is really important. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that you, hit, you hit it on the head there. I mean, I think we, we, you know, MRD often trumps many things, but when we think about some of these cytogenetics, uh, these, are, these are so important. And just because you can get someone negative does not mean that they're gonna stay negative, right? And, and that speaks to the earlier point of how our, uh, 
how our population, our relapse population is changing with, with some of these exciting new medicines. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Please make sure to claim your CME credits by completing the post-test and evaluation form at the link on the screen. And make sure to follow Bonham CE on Twitter and stay tuned for more exciting ALL content.